afternoon to the final year students. My name is Dr. Maheshwar Naidu, and we have uh, another lecture, online lecture today. The topic being the approach to bowel obstruction. Uh, just a few housekeeping tips. Please make sure that all your microphones are muted. Um, I will be making this session uh, interactive like last week, so I will be asking questions. There are a few poll questions as well, which you can answer online. But when I do ask either for volunteers or I call out your name, can you please um, unmute your microphone immediately? Uh, it's fine if you don't know the answer, just let me know. I'm not going to give you a hard time. But, uh, but these moments of silence are very um, problematic because we don't know whether you have a problem with your mic, whether you're not even present, but you've logged in. So please um, immediately type on the chat that you have a problem with your mic and then uh, we'll move on to someone else to, to try and save time. These uh, long periods of waiting uh, really delay the flow of the lecture. Okay, so if I can please uh, ask your cooperation on that. Okay, so let's get on with the topic of bowel obstruction. And um, we're going to start off with uh, signs and uh, symptoms, um, which I would uh, immediately like to ask someone to uh, give some answers about. Uh, let's see, can we ask Siabonga Zulu? Siabonga. Hello, Dr. Naito, can you hear me? Siabonga, yeah, I can hear you. So yes. can you give us some signs and symptoms of bowel obstruction. It's not actually difficult. It's actually on the, the picture uh, that you can hopefully see. Okay, so they can present with uh, vomiting. They can also present with uh, abdominal pain and abdominal distension. Yes. Uh, and al yes, and also... Uh, Constipation or obstipation. Yeah. Uh, so it's obstipation, yes. right? Not constipation. Obstipation, yes. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, um, presentation. Uh... Oh, they can also present with diarrhea as well. Diarrhea? Is that a common uh, sign in no. bile obstruction? You just said obstipation, which I agree with. Why, why are you now saying diarrhea? Okay, let's just leave it at obstipation. Anything else? Just look at the slide. Can you, can you see the slide clearly? All the answers are on the slide. I don't know why you're struggling. Yes, I can see the, I can see the, the slide. Yeah. So do you want to add anything? You said abdominal pain distension, obstipation, anything else? Anyone else want to volunteer? Thanks, Siabonga. Kululeko. Kululeko is logged in many times. I don't know which one to choose. Uh, let's take Ndumiso. Ndumiso. Hi, Ndumiso. Hi, can you hear me? Talk? Yes, I can. Uh, okay, also, they can also have vomiting. I think he counted that one as well. Yeah, vomiting, okay. Anything else? What makes bowel obstruction dangerous? Why is it a surgical emergency? Mm. Uh, okay, um, not sure. I think uh, if we would delay uh, intervention, then they may lead to uh, complications because they, they, there's no, no bowel movement. The patient is not getting nutrients, and sometimes they will also have some strangulation, meaning that there will be some necrosis going on there. So, yes. any delays will lead to 
and it yeah. delays will lead to some systemic uh, expansion and yeah okay so from the slide the main thing that you you were right in that you can get bowel necrosis but hypotension and shock right can you all see my pointer i think last week uh, we we're having some difficulty with this just let me know if you cannot see my pointer you should be able to see the white uh, arrow a mouse arrow okay so hypotension and shock can you see yeah. my arrow computer? can you see what i'm yes, pointing at okay so this is this is on this slide is one of the most important things and if you don't treat um, bowel obstruction rapidly then the patient can develop hypotension and shock and obviously if they strangulate like you mentioned uh, here you can see blood supply venous compression oxygenation of the bowel wall right all of that was correct they can actually get bowel necrosis and if you remember from last week i showed you a picture of a patient with black bowel and I told you that was a very dangerous condition. So that can actually happen in uh, bowel obstruction. Now, what about management of these symptoms in Dumiso while we have you here? Right on the left side of the screen, I've got management of symptoms. Each one of those things that was mentioned, how are you actually going to manage them in the acute phase? Uh, for the hypertension and the shock, so you would have to actively, uh, aggressively resuscitate Yes, so you're going to put in IV fluid, correct? Uh, Anything else? It's a resuscitation of the patient as well as surgery for if the bowel is necrotic, so you have to take the So before we can get to theater, we've got to optimize the patient. So we can't just, um, you know, as the patient arrives and say, gosh, this is bowel obstruction, I can see it clinically and on x-ray and you call theater and the patient goes straight to theater. I don't think any of you have ever seen that happen, right? There's always got to be a workup. Um, so I'm talking specifically about management. So not too worried about lab investigations, et cetera. We will do those. But what are you going to do to sort out, let's say, let's take vomiting. What can you do to uh, sort that out, Dumiso? So um, the first point on the right side of the screen, vomiting, right? How are you going to manage that? Is there anything that you can do? Demisa, you with us? Okay, let's give Demisa a break. Caitlin Theophilus. Caitlin, the question is um, the symptoms and signs on the right of the screen. I want some management principles in the acute phase. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Caitlin, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so you said IV fluid. So maybe uh, to stop, uh, you need to um, assess the electrolyte and correct any electrolyte abnormalities. Yes. Okay, um, you can correct that, which will be corrected with the IV fluid. What fluid would you, uh, would you use? Uh, so your crystalloid fluid, so... Good. Uh, yeah, your which, use your crystalloid. Which crystalloid would you choose? Um, ring of lactate. Yes, that's fine, good. Um, because that also contains electrolytes which you are wanting to replace. Um, sodium chloride, potassium, etc. Okay, then yeah. what about the next symptom at the top of the uh, right side of the screen, vomiting? What are you going to do to treat that? Maybe administer an antiemetic. Yes, you can. And what is uh, um, more effective than that? Um, not too sure. Okay, so guys, your your final year. One of the major components of your uh, exams is actually management, right? You are no longer in fourth year where you are just learning the, um, you know, the pathophysiology, etc. Right? The major component of final year is management. So it's very important that you'll actually understand management. That's why I'm asking you these questions, right? Okay, maybe uh, insertion you know. of an entry tube. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Insertion of a nasogastric tube. 
right? You're going to relieve all this. I mean, it's on the, on the picture. You're going to put a nasogastric tube down. All the dilated bowel, all the dilated stomach is all going to settle down because it's all going to drain out into the nasogastric tube. Good. What about abdominal pain? You know, they typically have a cramping type of abdominal pain. What okay, you so you can administer your, um, your analge analgesia. Yeah. Good. Right, abdominal distension is going to be treated by the nasogastric tube as well. Okay, so that's already covered. Hypovolemia, hypertension and shock is going to be treated by the IV fluid as well as electrolyte imbalance. And the last um, sign or symptom here is per, um, obstipation because what happens if you look at the lower end here of this picture, uh, the site of obstruction, right? There's a reflex action whereby distal to the site of obstruction, the peristalsis in the bowel uh, stops completely, okay? And that results in obstipation. Okay, so in terms of the management IV fluid, you're gonna, that's gonna be for fluid replacement uh, to prevent hypertension and shock. You're gonna collect, correct electrolyte imbalances because of the electrolytes that are contained in fluids like Ringer's lactate, nasogastric, Drainage, very important, analgesia. Antiemetic can be used, uh, but more importantly is nasogastric drainage. Okay, good, we are making progress. Okay, now we come to a horrible slide that has many, many, many lists of causes, but I don't want you to um, worry about all of the causes. At some point, um, you do need to actually know these, but um, if you can focus on the highlighted ones, I've highlighted with a, a red asterisk, right? On the uh, left, it's the mechanical bowel obstruction and there's about uh, six causes there. On the right, we've got functional bowel obstruction or what we rather call paralytic ileus, adynamic ileus, right? But it's not actually a mechanical bowel obstruction. The only one that I'm really concerned about there is peritonitis. So I'm going to ask someone to answer the first question, which is to give examples of each of the highlighted causes. Right, uh, Tobila Tsela, Tobile, sorry. Tobile. Yes, doctor. Hi, Tobile. Um, Hi. Can you just look at these? Can you see the ones that are highlighted with red asterisks? Right, can you yes. give me possibly uh, an example of each one? Um, as far as you can go, if you can go to the end of, uh, I think there's seven asterisks, that would be great, but try and go as far as you can. You can select which ones you know. You don't have to do it. In okay. Order. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll start with the volvulus. Sigmoid yes. volvulus is the one that I know. Very good. Sigmoid volvulus, very common cause. Which bowel is involved? Which sigmoid is part of which type of bowel? The colon, the colon, a large bowel, good. Which the large other, bowel, yeah. Yeah, which is the other type of volvulus that you can get in the colon? Which other part besides the sigmoid can uh, twist? Um, I don't know. Okay, it's the cecum. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. fine. Any any other um, causes that, or examples that you can give? Um, Intersusception. Yes. That, that would be the ileocecal junction. Yes, the valve. very good. Good. So the small bowel intersusceps into the cecum and ascending colon. Good. Mm. Anything else? Primary, primary neoplasms. Neoplasms. neoplasms would yeah. be like for example, colorectal cancer. Yes, correct. Right? It. It's a common cause of uh, colonic obstruction. Good. Anything else to be like? Parasitic infections, we discussed it, discussed it last week, the Good. ascaris. Yes. Lum, yeah, Lumbricoides. the long word. <laughs> Ascarisis, yeah. Lumbricoides, very good, right? Remember, what did we yeah. speak about? Can you remember the name of the condition? Um, it was typhi, salmonella typhi. No, yeah, I'm not no. confusing it. I'm confusing yeah. it. <laughs> okay. So it's not, not anything complicated. It's just a worm bolus obstruction. Or oh, yeah. bolus volvulus. Good. You're doing well. Anything else? We've got adhesions, hernia, and we've got peritonitis left. Mm. Hernias. Well, mm -hmm. I don't can herniate through the the inguinal canal yes. into the. Good. An inguinal 
uh, canal hernia or inguinal hernia can result yeah. in bowel being mechanically obstructed. Right? You can also have incisional hernias right, from previous mm -hmm. surgery. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, so you're just you're doing very well. You've just got adhesions left and um, peritonitis. Okay, I, I don't know about the others. <laughs> okay, now you've done very well, Kabila. Okay, so I'm just going to run through these. Adhesions are an extremely common cause, and usually the commonest reason for this is post-operative. So if the patient has a previous laparotomy for whatever reason, perfed appendix, perforated ulcer, uh, cancer, um, it might have been a laparotomy for trauma, right? So commonest cause of mechanical bowel obstruction is adhesive bowel obstruction following a previous surgery to the abdomen, right? So one of the first things you should do when examining the patient is to see if they have any abdominal scars, right? And it may not only be a midline laparotomy scar, it may in fact be a um, scar in the groin, right? Um, uh, such as an inguinal hernia, right? So you actually need to examine those areas properly to look for those scars, etc. Okay, then peritonitis, um, we'll come to that. Right. Um, now I've got a poll that I'm going to launch. Um, and the question is, of all causes highlighted on this slide, which, pre which, is, which presents as the most common, which presents most commonly? Right. You should see a poll coming up on your screen. Please just, uh, you can answer more than one option. So choose more than one option and let's see how we go. I'm going to give you guys about a minute to answer. You, so you can select more than one option. Okay, so the vast majority of people are going for adhesive bowel obstruction, which is unfortunately not quite correct, despite what I just said. It's a bit of a trick, unfortunately. Okay, five more seconds. Three, two, one, and I'm ending the poll. Okay, I'm going to share the results with you. All right, you should be able to see that the vast majority of you guys chose adhesive bowel obstruction. Um, but if you see how I posed the question, I didn't actually say what is the commonest cause of mechanical bowel obstruction. When I was speaking about adhesions just now and uh, post-operative uh, being the commonest cause, I said the commonest cause of, of mechanical bowel obstruction. Right? But my question was a bit of a trick. I said on this slide, right, which includes the right side of the slide, which is the commonest cause. So those of you, I think there were six people that answered paralytic ileus. Right? Those six people can give yourselves a pat on the back. I, I'm not sure if you guessed it or you actually understood, but on this particular slide, the commonest cause right, of abdominal pain and distension is peritonitis. So, and, then, and that causes um, adhesive, sorry, not adhesive, it causes an ileus, paralytic ileus or adynamic ileus. And that is what actually um, is the commonest cause, right? So I need you to understand this concept. Um, if you are a little bit confused, that's good. I expect you to be a little bit confused, but we're going to clarify this matter now. Okay, so now we're going into this more detail. The commonest cause of abdominal pain, distension, and peritonitis. So mark what I'm saying. I'm not saying the commonest cause of mechanical bowel obstruction. It's the commonest cause of abdominal pain, distension, and peritonitis. And to um, elicit this point, I've got a little case history. I've got a 17-year-old male patient who presented with a five-day history of abdominal pain, vomiting, and decreased bowel movement, which is basically obstipation. He had an enema two days previously. He now presents acutely ill and tachycardic, hypertensive. His abdomen is acutely tender, distended, and peritonitic. Right, this is the x-ray that we have. What is the commonest cause of this picture? So as you could have guessed, right, from what we've been talking about, let's get someone to volunteer. Can we 
ask Sabello Zulu. Sabello. Good afternoon, Dr. Hi, Sabella. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, so there's two things here. There's the what what is the commonest cause of this picture from what I've just said, and then we're going to ask you to elicit the radiological findings or list them. I'm not sure if it diagnosed. Okay, what about the radiological findings? What do you see on this X-ray? Mm, I think there's a sign of fall of striking with... Uh, yes. What are those signs that you can see? The darker color, I'm not sure it's right here. Mm. I think there might be a gas on the bowels. Mm. Mm. So there's dilated loops of bowel. Which bowel is it? Which bowel is dilated? Anyone else want to answer? Thank you, Sabella. Shira Sudi. Shira Sudi, are you with us? Um, hi, Dr. Naidu. Yes, yeah, Shira. Um, I'd say it's the dilated, the small bowel are dilated. Yes. And the question on the left of the screen, what is the commonest cause? What we've just been speaking about? Like a paralytic alias. Yes, correct. Right, paralytic alias, and the radiological findings. You mentioned the dilated loops of small bowel. You can actually see them here. Anything else that you can see? Right, there's the dilated loops of small bowel that I've outlined. Anything else you can see, Shira? Uh, can I say what sign you'd look for? I'm not yeah. sure exactly. Okay, I know you look for like a step ladder sign. Um, yes, from last week's step ladder sign, but that's in mechanical bowel obstruction, remember. Okay. So this okay. is actually ileus. You, you could also look for like fluid, free fluid um, in the bowel. Yes, um, you're not going to see free fluid in the bowel. You're going to see free fluid between the loops. Can you see this white line here? Where mm -hmm. can you, you guys see my mouse? Right, so there's, a, there's air in the bowel here, air in the bowel there. So that is basically fluid that's probably lying between the loops of bowel. So it's possible that that's pus, uh, you know, from a uh, acute peritonitis, right? Mm. So it's not fluid in the, you're not gonna see fluid in the bowel, right? You could, if it was an erect X-ray, this could possibly be an air fluid level. You can see a straight line there with radiolucency above and radio opaque below. So that could possibly be an air fluid level. So that could be um, fluid in the bowel, but it's not generally easy to see, right? But the important things to distinguish between uh, ileus and mechanical bowel obstruction, both of them will have dilated loops of small bowel, but the, um, someone has their hand up, Msizi uh, Wake. I'd like to try, I think it's the yes. absence of uh, the hostra that's, that, uh, that's important for the paralytic ileus. Okay, so um, hostra is actually in the colon. The paralytic ileus, uh, as the name suggests, ileus um, is ile comes from ileum, uh, which is small bowel. So we don't usually have paralytic ileus affecting the colon. So... Um, we're not really worried about the hostra. And what we can actually see, if you look at this shadow here, I had a very vague shadow. 
that's actually the cecum and the beginning of the colon. And then we see uh, another loop of uh, large bowel there, right? So um, yeah, no, Hastra is not, not really uh, what we worried about, right? The next thing that I was wanting to point out is the presence of air in the rectum, right? Can you see that little gas bubble there? That is important to notice because it means that there is air in the rectum and this is against the finding of mechanical bowel obstruction. So mechanical bowel obstruction, I'll show you another x-ray just now. You usually have an absence of air in the rectum, but here, because this is an ileus, you may have air in the rectum, right? And then this little loop of uh, air in the colon, uh, I told you was normal, right? And then we did mention that the commonest cause of this x-ray picture is in fact a paralytic ileus, and that's usually secondary to peritonitis. Okay, is everyone clear on that? If there's any uh, questions, please put up your hand. Thank you, Shira, I'm going to mute you now. Okay, so next uh, clinical findings, same patient. Remember, we've got this 17 year old male who's been sick for five days and um, only got to us now. All right, this is the nasogastric tube, All right, the bag which is uh, connected to the nasogastric tube. This is lying on the side of the patient's bed. Actually, this is a theater table. This picture was taken in theater. Right? And you can see there's a very dark green color to this. So this is what we call bile stained uh, nasogastric aspirate. Okay. Now, last week I spoke to you about this. I showed you this picture, which was feculent nasogastric aspirate. You can see the difference in color. This is green and this is brown. This looks more like stool. Now, we uh, explained that this suggests a long-standing obstruction. The bowel obstruction has been there for some time. So my question now is why is it this an emergency, Where, especially when you see feculent material? If you only saw green uh, bile staining, right, you do have some time. You can still uh, possibly order a gastrograph and meal and follow through. You can um, wait um, for that to work, which may take up to four hours. But if you see feculent material like this, it is an indication for the patient to go straight to theater, right? You're going to take those first steps that we said, IV fluid, analgesia, nasogastric tube, and you're pretty much going to rush the patient to theater. You may want to get an X-ray while you're waiting, but you're not going to delay the patient to wait for an X-ray. Right? Now the question is, why is this an emergency? And what will happen if we fail to take the patient to theater urgently? Uh, can we ask uh, Timbani uh, Macheke Cheke? Um, yes, Timbani? I'm still thinking, Dr. Nancy. Very good. I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you, Timbani. We've got a hand up. Sulake, do you have the answer for us? Hello, Dr. Naili. Can you hear me? Yes, Sulake. Uh, I, I think um, with the, with, with like seeing, the, seeing the feculent material, I think uh, the, the bacteria causing this type of presentation I think the gas formed by the bacteria along with the distension will exacerbate to having like more distension, which um, puts, the, puts the patient at risk of uh, more ischemic necrosis or pressure necrosis. And there's a risk of like uh, um, perforation. And if the, the fecal and like the bacteria, if it was to go into like the other areas of the bowel, uh, secondary to perforation, that will put the patient into shock and, and uh, risk of like uh, widespread sepsis. Yes, yeah, good. So basically um, there's a risk of perforation, which you mentioned. Perforation is not, um, not that the contents will go into other parts of the bowel, but it will go into the peritoneal cavity and thereby cause a peritonitis, right? And obviously uh, that's going to add to the patient's problems. And then you mentioned that um, there could be uh, 
excessive distension, strangulation, and the bowel can actually necrose, which is also a uh, huge problem because I remem remember that black bowel um, or necrotic bowel is very dangerous to the patient. Good Zulakin. Right, and it's not, we're not too concerned about the gas forming organisms. Um, it's just the fact that there's feculent material, it suggests that this has been long standing. Okay, and the fact that it's long standing suggests that there's no time to delay. Right, we need to sort this out as a matter of urgency. Okay, good. All right, we're moving on now. This is the same patient, 17 year old male patient at the time of laparotomy. Right, when we opened up, we found all of this. Who can describe what they can see in this picture? Siobhan Singh. Uh, hi, Dr. Naidu. Can hi, you Siobhan. hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I can see that the bowel is looking quite uh, dilated. Yes. Uh, it's also looking, the color is not looking consistent. I can see some patches of white and mm -hmm. uh, some of uh, erythema or like redness and some is a bit more like moist or glazed appearance sort of mm -hmm. in comparison to others. So this is the white areas that you're talking about that I'm pointing to. Is that what you mean by the white? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right there. Good. And then this is, uh, this is quite red, right? Yes. So it's quite inflamed, hyperemic. Now, there mm -hmm. isn't actually a loop of normal bowel. Uh, you might remember from one of our past photographs what normal bowel looks like, but pretty much all of this bowel is inflamed, okay, yes. and very dilated, right? Uh, so uh, that's excellent. Now, what do you think this white stuff is here? Uh... I'm not sure, to be honest. I don't know if it's maybe slough from yes. pressure or the tension. Uh, no. Um, so this picture has been uh, taken after we've actually drained out all the pus. When we opened, there was lots of pus. You can actually see the drapes are quite moist, right? So okay. there's quite a bit of pus there. So it's actually related to the pus. Do you, does anyone have an idea of what we call this type of inflammation? Or Siobhan, if you know as well. Um, I'm not sure though. Okay, this is called a fibrinoparulent exudate. Right, so okay. fibrino suggests fibrinous material. You know, fibrin is a very dry, uh, sticky stuff, right? And parulent means pus. So the parulent component, we've actually already dried it up and yes. removed it from the operative field, right? But the fibrinous part still remains adherent to the bowel. Okay, so that's fibrinoparulent exudate, right? And that's uh, part of the peritonitis. And then the free liquid pus I mentioned to you has already been removed and this has stained the drapes. Okay, good. So this is basically what you would find uh, in acute peritonitis. Siobhan, what do you think the cause might be? On the next slide, I'm gonna show you the cause. So before we show that slide, what do you think it might be? Commonest cause in our setting? Uh... Um, maybe TB abdomen? No, this is not, uh, TB is common, but not, it's not the commonest. I'm sure some of you have actually had this condition. Right? It's very common. At least a few of you must have had this condition sometime in your life. Anyone want to volunteer? commonest cause of peritonitis? No? Thanks, Siobhan. Uh, yes, we have a hand up. You see this okay? I think appendicitis. Yes, good Mcizivake, right. Appendicitis, extremely common. Did you perhaps have appendicitis in Mcizivake? <laughs> no. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> okay. Hands up, hands up anyone who had appendicitis, unless you'll have something to feel shy about. There's nothing wrong with having appendicitis. Anyone in the class 
had appendicitis. I'm very surprised if no one has had it. Okay, so what are we seeing in this picture? Msiziwake, do you want to uh, answer further? All right, we've got some surgical instruments in there. We're holding something. What do you think we're holding? Yeah, I think it's the appendix. It looks, uh, it's not consistent with the rest of the power because there's some area which looks, uh, it's whitish. Yes. The one that is being held with the, forc with the forcep. That's so right. Okay. So this picture is a little bit difficult because there's a lot of reflection from this uh, surgical retractor here. So I've just got a blow up of the same picture and you can see the appendix. There's the base of the appendix, right? There's two clamps being applied probably to the um, appendiceal artery because the appendix is going to be removed shortly. So the two clamps are applied to the appendiceal artery. We're going to put a clamp across the appendix shortly. Right, or this may be, I think that may, no, that's just part of the um, swab, sorry. Um, and then a Babcock forcep is holding the appendix. You can see the appendix is very red and inflamed and also more fibrinoparillant exudate all over the appendix. We don't actually see an area of perforation in this photograph, but it's very likely that the appendix had perforated and this is a perforated appendix. Okay, good. So what is shown in this photograph, this is the same patient now. We did not close the abdomen in the normal fashion. We instead put this device. Does anyone know what this is? Have they seen this perhaps in the past? Pumzile Shabango. Pumzile, are you with us? Someone's got a hand up in Kululeko and Dunge. In Kululeko, you there? Can you hear me, Doc? Yes, I can hear you in Kululeko. I think it's Bogota bag, I don't know. Yes, good. Bogota bag, B-O-G-O-T-A, right? So it's actually just a... Um, Fluid bag, this is probably a three liter fluid bag, which might have contained mannitol or normal saline. The fluid has been emptied. The reason we use it is because it is sterile, right? So it's a sterile bag, we throw out the fluid and then we use the bag to close the abdomen. Do you have any idea why in Kululeko? In Kululeko, you're still there? Um, I think so that we can be able to this pass. Yes. So are you breaking up the Nkululeko? Just repeat your answer. You seem to be having problems with the microphone. So basically you can see how massively dilated this bowel is in this previous picture. Now, to try and push all of that back into the abdomen is gonna cause problems, right? You can have a problem uh, of raised intra-abdominal pressure, right? Uh, there's a condition called abdominal compartment syndrome, and this can cause a lot of problems uh, with the patient post-operatively in ICU. Uh, the patient may have difficulty breathing, difficulty ventilating, right? So to prevent that raised uh, intra-abdominal pressure or abdominal compartment syndrome, we take a prophylactic step of closing the abdomen with this plastic bag, which as you can see um, is flexible. And if there is um, in more distension of the abdomen or the bowel, it will be controlled by the bag. Okay, does everyone understand that concept of a Bogota bag? Huh? So going on to uh, what I was talking about earlier, the commonest cause of abdominal pain, distension and peritonitis is a paralytic ileus. Right, it is not the commonest cause of mechanical bowel obstruction. Okay, so I need you all to uh, understand this point. I've sort of labored the point, um, but it's very important that you'll understand this because the commonest presentation that you as a junior doctor are gonna see is actually a paralytic ileus, right? And I do not want you to confuse that as mechanical bowel obstruction because as a uh, doctor at a 
a higher level of care. I'm uh, at Jimbolizana Hospital. Um, we frequently get calls from junior doctors at the base hospitals saying that they've got a patient with bowel obstruction, right? And unfortunately, it's not actually bowel obstruction. It's usually a paralytic ileus secondary to a perforated appendix, right? And that is by far the commonest cause of this presentation. And you have to appreciate that bowel obstruction is managed completely differently to um, acute peritonitis. So it's, you'd rather uh, mistake um, mechanical bowel obstruction for acute peritonitis than the other way around. Okay, please let me know if you need me to explain further, but it's very important that you understand this concept. Now we are going to move on to the actual commonest cause of mechanical bowel obstruction. Now all of you that answered in the um, poll, right? All of you that answered adhesive bowel obstruction, this is the correct answer. Right? So here the commonest cause is adhesive bowel obstruction, secondary to previous abdominal surgery. Right? Remember from last week we spoke about the stack of coins and the step ladder. Right? So I've shown you that same picture from last week. And what you need to appreciate here is that there is no air in the rectum. Right? There's no air in the rectum grossly distended small bowel, but remember that with mechanical, with uh, uh, paralytic ileus, you also get dilated loops of small bowel, right? But you don't commonly get the um, stack of coins and stepladder appearance with ileus, right? Okay, now this is a patient uh, who the x-ray belongs to. He was taken to theater and we found extensive adhesions. You can see that the bowel is uh, inflamed, but it's not acutely peritonitic. It's not like that other picture where it was massively distended. It is distended because the proximal loops of bowel are dilated due to the distal obstruction, but it's not acutely peritonitic. Okay, so we basically carefully dissected all the adhesions that were obstructing the bowel, right? We unraveled the bowel. You can see it's still very distended. And what we do, you might have seen this uh, if you managed or you had the opportunity to go into theater where we would milk these bowel contents either into the colon or we'd milk it retrograde into the uh, duodenum and stomach and we would ask the anesthetist to put suction on the nasogastric tube to suck all that content out and that allows the bowel to collapse and we may then possibly be able to push it back into the peritoneal cavity. Okay, this was the complete adhesiolysis performed Right. Um, and this we would then try and push back into the abdomen. And if we couldn't, or if we were concerned about raised intra-abdominal pressure or um, abdominal compartment syndrome, we may also close with a Bogota bag. Right. Any questions, guys? Please put up your hands. Right. So the flow diagram shown on this slide. Um, is to emphasize the approach to adhesive bowel obstruction, right? Adhesive bowel obstruction, remember you're going to examine the patient, you'll very frequently find some type of a scar, either a midline laparotomy, possibly a subcostal cocker incision on the right from a previous cholecystectomy. They might have a lens incision from a previous appendectomy. Um, they may have um, uh, inguinal hernia incision, right? Interestingly enough, Fan and steel incisions, which I've done uh, for um, caesarean sections, right? They can possibly cause adhesive bowel obstruction, but they generally don't. It's not that common to find a transverse lower uh, abdominal incision, which is called a fan and steel incision, uh, causing bowel obstruction. And the very likely uh, reason for this is that a pregnant uterus is pushing all the small bowel out of the way. And even after delivery of the baby by Caesar sec cesarean section, the uterus is quite enlarged and keeps the bowel away from the uh, inner aspect of the fan and steel scar, which is healing. And for this reason, possibly, we do not often see adhesions in uh, post fan and steel incision. Right? Bear in mind, fan and steel incisions are also used by gynecologists for pelvic surgery. So you must find out from the patient whether the reason for the fan and steel incision was for a Caesar or for a gynae procedure because a gynae procedure uh, may result in 
um, adhesive bowel obstruction occurring. Okay, so remember we spoke about uh, signs and symptoms of strangulation, uh, which would suggest, which, which would be suggested by peritonitis or um, abdominal tenderness, right, directly over the hernia or um, over the bloops of bowel that are dilated. Intestinal ischemia, any suggestion of black bowel, uh, which could be detected on a blood gas, which shows metabolic acidosis. Then we would rush the patient to theater and remember what I said about feculent material in the nasogastric tube. This would, should be included here and all of those patients should go straight to the operating theater. If none of those features are present, then you can consider whether uh, the patient has mechanical bowel obstruction and you can do a gastrogaffin meal and follow through. Gastrogaffin is a water soluble uh, contrast medium. We discussed this last week um, and it can be both diagnostic and therapeutic. Right? And if the gastrogaffin uh, four hours after the gastrogaffin is given and we take an x-ray and we find gastrogaffin has made its way into the cecum and colon, that would suggest that there is no small bowel obstruction or possibly that the gastrogaffin has managed to therapeutic, therapeutic, be therapeutic and reduce that uh, obstruction and has thereby passed into the colon, in which case we can continue to manage the patient conservatively if there is improvement and uh, we can avoid surgery. Right? Patients that have adhesive bowel obstruction, if you operate again, they are likely to develop uh, even worse adhesive bowel obstruction later on down the line. So as far as possible, uh, the idea is to try and avoid repeated surgery, okay? Now, um, if the patient, while you're observing, while you're doing a gastrographin, they start developing signs and symptoms of ischemia, acidosis, peritonitis, then at that point, you're going to rush them to the operating theater. Right, this side of the slide, um, I don't like this concept of partial bowel obstruction, but uh, just don't worry about it. So I'm only really concerned with this part of the slide here. Okay, good. Uh, if there are any questions, guys, please put up your hands. All right, so the commonest cause of it, um, mechanical bowel obstruction is adhesive bowel obstruction, and that is most often due to previous surgery. All right, now we're coming to the second commonest cause of mechanical bowel obstruction, and that is hernias, right? It could be an inguinal hernia or it could be an incisional hernia, right? But basically what happens, there's a small neck, loops of bowel tend to go through that neck and get stuck in a uh, peritoneal sac, right? Uh, this looks more like a, an incisional hernia. It could also be an inguinal hernia. Remember the Inguinal canal contains the spermatic uh, cord in uh, male patients, and this has a component called a patent processus vaginalis, right, which is a part of the embryological development uh, in the neonate. And that patent processus vaginalis in children uh, can lead to um, hernias. Uh, later on, even if there isn't a patent processus vaginalis, there is a latent defect or weakness um, in the anterior abdominal wall and chronic coughing, um, straining to pass urine or stool, chronic constipation, um, benign prostatic hypertrophy and uh, manual labor where uh, laborers are physically lifting and straining their abdominal wall muscles uh, during their daily work. This can contribute to hernia formation. Okay, so just to show you a clinical picture, this is a man with a massive incisional hernia. You can see the irregularity of his abdomen, right? This is probably just uh, obesity, but here you can see a huge bulge, which is directly related to that surgical incision, which is going all the way across, right? So this bulge here is very likely an incisional hernia. And what happens here is that the patient has previous surgery, uh, for whatever reason, the surgical repair wasn't adequate um, and the patient uh, a few months or years after the surgery develops an incisional hernia. Uh, this is an example of an umbilical hernia right, which could be spontaneous and this is an example of a left inguinal hernia. Right? You can see it's 
hugely dilated and the, both these patients presented with features of obstruction right? and uh, they were taken to theater. I have more pictures of this patient here. Uh, this is the same patient with a massively dilated left scrotum. So he's got an inguinoscrotal hernia. We were unable, we did make an incision on the scrotum. We tried to reduce the hernia from there, but we failed. And we were then uh, required to make a midline laparotomy. You can see the hugely dilated loops of small bowel and distally where the obstruction, distal to the obstruction, the loops of bowel looked more normal. Here, this picture is not too well lit. Uh, you can see again, dilated proximal loops and normal caliber uh, distal loops. Okay, then I'd like someone to volunteer or I'm going to select someone. There's three organs that were resected in the same patient, right? Uh, not the best of clinical photographs, but um, can we have someone identify these? Erin Taylor. Good afternoon. Hi, Erin. Um, number one looks like it could be the appendix. Mm -hmm. Looks a bit big for the appendix, don't you think? See this here, um, what, what do you think that might be? Is that a lymph node? Why would the patient have lymph nodes? Mm, okay, try sure. two and three. Two and three, Aaron? Um, Two, looks like it could be the stomach. Hmm. It's a bit small. I think we can uh, I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> okay. Okay, thanks, Aaron. We had someone's hand up just now. Anyone else want to volunteer? Yes, we have a hand up. Jabula Wiseman. Jabula, do you have a hand? Hi. Yes. Oh, if number one, I think it must be a testes. So. Yes, correct. Right, this is the testes here, and this is the whole very inflamed spermatic cord, right? And it was resected. Number two? Number two, maybe a duodenum. Guys, we don't take out things like the duodenum and stomach, right? Unless there's a very uh, specific reason, right? Like gastric cancer or something or pancreatic cancer. Otherwise, we, we try to preserve those organs because they are vital, okay? So um, remember, this was an inguinal hernia. It's very unlikely that the stomach or the duodenum is going to get stuck in there. This is actually a loop of small bowel, right? If you go back here, Right, we said, oh, yeah. can you see all the stuff? This is all the stuff oh, that's yeah. inside the peritoneum. So we, I mean, inside this uh, hernial sac in the left scrotum, right? So we can't see it in the photograph, but the testes was in there. There's a loop of small bowel. And what do you think this is in Jabula? Fatty material. Okay. What fatty material is there in the abdominal cavity. Siobhan? Uh, is it omentum, Dr. Ned? Yes, correct. Right, that's omentum, right? Remember the omentum, the policeman of the abdomen, right? It's very useful in stopping um, sepsis from tracking when you have a perforated appendix or a perforated gastric ulcer. You might find the omentum adherent, and we even use some of the omentum to patch the gastric ulcer. I think we mentioned that last week. All right, so that's omentum. That's the small bowel that was trapped inside the left scrotum. It was not viable, and therefore we resected it. We were able to reanastomose the two ends of the bowel, so the patient um, uh, could have continuity of the GIT. Right? The testes was non-viable, so one of the important things that you as junior doctors need to bear in mind when taking consent 
is that if a patient has a large inguinoscrotal hernia or even a small inguinoscrotal hernia, always take consent for orchidectomy, right? Because once the patient is under anesthetic, you cannot then change the consent, right? And you might find that the testes is non-viable, right? So you need to remove it intra-op. So please take the consent preoperatively. Uh, this is the operative photograph um, showing, just emphasizing again, the difference between the proximal small bowel and the distal uh, small bowel, which is normal caliber. And this segment of bowel here was actually trapped inside this. So we can't actually see it here. And the photograph is not adequately lit. So we cannot see, but this is probably just the omentum uh, that we removed there. And somewhere in there is the small bowel number two and number one, the left testes, which are all had to be resected. Okay, good. And this is the patient postoperatively. We put a drain in here. Uh, we've closed the abdomen normally, right? He's got a Foley catheter draining urine, right? And uh, that was um, what it looked like. You can see it's much better. The swelling has gone down. Uh, so the patient is in a much better condition post-op than he was pre-op. Okay, now moving on to another common cause. This is more common in the pediatric age group. It's not common to get worm bolus obstruction in adults, right? We spoke about this last week, Ascarizes lumbricoides, right? Huge volume of worms. I'm not gonna go into detail of the uh, life cycle, but basically, unfortunately, it's fecal-oral spread. And if there's contaminated food, contaminated water, um, uh, Patients then consume that and the ova develop inside their abdomen, right? Radiological findings in worm bolus obstruction. We see these funny looking uh, incomplete opacification, right? Is actually the length of the worm. The gap in between is just normal uh, GIT uh, fluid um, from the gastrointestinal tract, either food content or mucus, which is secreted by the small bowel. More x-rays, these are two different children. This just shows dilate, like multiple dilated loops of small bowel, right? Um, the picture on the right, uh, gastrographin has been given and we can actually vaguely see the outlines of the worms, right? And the gastrographin has not, this is gastrographin in the stomach. This is all small bowel, but you don't see any gastrographin in the colon. And this suggests that the patient is completely obstructed and this patient would very likely need to go to theater for laparotomy. Okay, this is a patient, um, I'm not sure which x-ray it was, but one of these patients, right? Child took them to theater and we found completely necrotic bowel. Remember, the weight of the worm bolus causes the bowel to evolve, right? It actually twists. And in twisting, the mesentery also twists. Contained in the mesentery is the blood supply to the small bowel. So if it is left for too long, the small bowel then necroses. You can see this small bowel is not pink. It's actually turned a uh, sluffy brownish yellow color and is completely non-viable. This entire segment, you can see this is almost a meter of small bowel that has been resected and photographed, right? And I've written here a lesson in photography. Unfortunately, uh, this wasn't a case that I was involved with. Um, the doctors that took the pictures, they did not put off the theater lights. Guys, if you are taking photographs intraoperatively, the theater lights, the bright uh, xenon lights that I used to uh, operate with must be switched off. And you rather use the flash uh, in your phone in, or camera to light the uh, operative field. Right. If you have this, what happens is that the bright light causes the camera iris to close and uh, you get a picture that looks like this. I've tried to optimize it um, in uh, my editing, but you can see that it doesn't look good. You can actually see the blown out light uh, reflecting off the bowel as well as the uh, green drape. Okay, so... I don't know if any of you are interested in photography, but this is very important if you're doing photographs intraoperatively. The theater lights should not be used. Right? Please put them off temporarily and take your picture, then immediately put them back on. 
Okay, so we've gone through a number of causes. We now come to intersusception, right? What happens? Uh, we've already heard that the commonest site of this is at the ileocecal junction. The ileum typically um, intersusceps into the cecum and ascending colon, right? And what happens is that you get a complete obstruction. Okay, so you get bowel intersuscepting into uh, the distal segment, proximal into the distal segment, the proximal segment gets dilated, and the distal segment is normal caliber. Right? This is an example of a photo, uh, schematic of iliocolic intersusception, and uh, this is what it looks like. You can also get ileoileal intersusception, and this usually uh, starts, they've got to be a, what we call a lead point, such as a pedunculated tumor, uh, or lesion in the mucosa, and what happens, the peristalsis in trying to push this uh, tumor along actually uh, promotes the uh, interception to develop. Uh, this is the clinical picture. The patient has blood per rectum, right, which is one of the features of interception. They call it red current jelly. Right? This x-ray just really shows dilated small bowel loops. Right? It isn't really specific but you do see an absence of air in the rectum, which is in keeping with a mechanical uh, small bowel obstruction. Okay, any questions guys, please put up your hands. This is the same patient. You can see the abdomen is markedly distended and the intraop findings, this is the ileum intersuscepting into the cecum. I'll show you a better picture now. Uh, there's the terminal ileum intersuscepting into the cecum there's the tinea coli, right? We were not able to reduce this, right? And we had to cut into the colon, reduce it physically, and then resect uh, the distinal ileum and the cecum. Right? This is the segment that was resected, right? You can see it all intersuscepted and you can see it's starting to turn black and necrotic, poorly perfused, because as you can imagine from uh, this picture here, the mesentery is compressed and the blood supply is affected. Right? So that's why you get necrotic bowel. It was resected and a primary ileocolic anastomosis was done. Okay, so we've covered pretty much all the major causes of small bowel obstruction. Uh, we are now going to move on to the common causes of large bowel obstruction. And here I'm going to ask, put up a poll. And I want you guys to tell me what you all think the commonest causes of large bowel obstruction are. Multiple uh, options, right? You can choose more than one. Giving you a minute to answer the poll. Sorry, I've only seen the chat now that there are some people who are unable to log in. Are there still people unable to log in? Just let me know. If you all can assist me by sending them the link. Uh, let me see if I can post the link on the chat. No, I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. Okay, going to end the poll now. Going to share the results with you. So, uh, 24 people chose sigmoid volvulus. 20 people chose CA colon. CA colon is the correct answer, right? Malignant obstruction is the commonest cause. I do agree that sigmoid volvulus is extremely common in our setting, right? Um, but not the commonest cause overall. 
Right. Some people say diverticular disease, that's probably the third commonest cause. Ulcerative colitis uh, generally doesn't present with obstruction. Um, adhesive bowel obstruction, nobody answered that, which is good, I'm happy, because adhesive bowel obstruction only affects the small bowel, doesn't affect the colon. Right. Worm bolus obstruction only affects the small bowel, not the colon. Acute appendicitis with peritonitis is not a cause of mechanical bowel obstruction. Right, so uh, it causes an ileus, dilated small bowel loops. Inguinal hernia is a rare cause. It is possible for, for example, the sigmoid colon to get into the um, inguinal hernia or possibly uh, an incisional hernia, right? But it's not by far the commonest cause. Uh, someone's selected Ogilvy syndrome. I think that might be a mistake. Uh, one person selected that. Uh, does anyone know what Ogilvy syndrome is? Can I have someone's hand up? We will, if I forget, just remind me to speak to you what Ogilvy syndrome is about. I'm going to stop sharing the poll now and you're going to actually look at the correct answer. So the correct answer here is CA colon, right? 65% of cases, CA colon, uh, colorectal cancer is the cause of obstruction. Volvulus, quite common, but far less so, 15%. And then diverticular, diverticulitis is uh, the third commonest cause. Then there are other causes as well, uh, which we alluded to. So good. Um, uh, happy that 20 people selected CA colon. The uh, majority, unfortunately, selected volvulus. So please remember that the commonest cause of large bowel obstruction is, in fact, malignant obstruction. Okay, moving on, uh, we will discuss sigmoid volvulus um, and sequel volvulus. So basically what happens as shown in these three consecutive uh, schematics, right? patients who have a redundant colon, they have an excessively long sigmoid colon, are prone to this condition because what happens, the weight of the stool, remember the stool in the sigmoid tends to be uh, quite dehydrated and heavy and the weight of that stool can cause the sigmoid to actually twist, right? And it twists and then it can become grossly dilated. You get a loss of Hausstra and it can then affect the blood supply in the mesentery, the sigmoid mesentery. And it can actually present, I showed you a picture last week of necrotic uh, sigmoid um, volvulus, right? At the time of laparotomy. Um, you can also get a sequel volvulus if you have a mobile cecum. The cecum commonly has a very short mesentery and is not very mobile. However, in certain patients, there's non-fixation of the cecum. They're born like this. It's congenital. And the cecum tends to twist, right? And um, you can get a sequel volvulus with uh, sequel necrosis due to ischemia as well. Right, going on to the radiological features. We mentioned this last week. Uh, we spoke about a coffee bean. This is a picture of a coffee bean and you can see it uh, closely resembles this grossly dilated sigmoid. This is the proximal and distal segments. This is called a line of summation where the sigmoid mesentery is actually visible as a white line between the two loops of grossly distended bowel. Can anyone tell me what this is here on the x-ray? It's an artifact or is it something really in the patient? Uh, this is just part of the label, so don't worry about that. You're looking at this x-ray, it's got nothing to do with the sigmoid volvulus, just something that you may find. Zimicilla lutuli. Zimicilla, are you with us? Uh, good afternoon. Hi, Zimicilla. <clears throat> I, um, so I thought about the hip replacement, but then I'm not sure for this patient. Yes, you're correct. Right. This is an orthopedic prosthesis. This is a hip replacement. It's um, not a total hip because the acetabulum is uh, still intact, right? So they've just replaced the uh, neck of femur, right? Possibly a um, number of reasons the patient might have a neck of femur fracture with uh, femoral head necrosis, right? So the joint is actually, the acetabulum is fine, but good, I'm glad you picked that up. Thank you, Zemisile. 
Okay, so this is a coffee bean appearance. You can see this one as well. It's not that clear cut, right? But it resembles a coffee bean, right? What we have here is SSS for sigmoid, and this is the descending colon here, right? Another picture showing a compression of the medial wall of the two sigmoid loops. And this is what contributes to the formation of this coffee bean sign. And the loops of the colon converge in the left hand side of the pelvis uh, with the loop extending up towards the right upper quadrant. So it goes across, there's a line across the abdomen from the uh, left iliac fossa to the right upper quadrant. Then they talk about the bead, uh, bird, bird beak sign, sorry, if you instill contrast, barium, uh, rectally, right? There's a twist, which I'll show you in the next picture. And this is shown by a bird beak appearance. You can see this looks quite a lot like a bird, the head of a bird, and there's the beak there. Okay, so these are all uh, X-ray features which will help you diagnose um, sigmoid volvulus. Okay, so has anyone seen this procedure being done? Do you know what this instrument is called? Uh, who can we ask? Alia Fisahi. Hi. Hi, Alia. Um, I'm, I have not seen this before. I'm not entirely sure what it's called. Do you know anything? Have you read up anything on uh, sigmoid volvulus that, um, you know, obviously this is used to treat sigmoid volvulus, one of the methods? Um, no. Okay. Is that a, 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 a proctosigmoid endoscopy, maybe? Uh, it's a, well, it's a sigmoidoscope, right? Oh, it's actually written on the slide. Rigid sigmoidoscope, right? So this is um, an outpatient uh, procedure. This can be done in the outpatients. Um, obviously, in this patient who's sick, you might prefer to uh, take them to the acute ward or possibly to theater, right? But the advantage of this is that you can actually use this to decompress this massively dilated loop of bowel, right? So if you can gently insert it and uh, get the um, tip of this instrument through that obstruction, you might be able to deflate that bowel and possibly save the patient, right? But you've got to be sure that there are no signs of ischemia. So if the patient has features of bowel ischemia, which are suggested as we've uh, repeatedly said by um, metabolic acidosis on the blood gas, then you shouldn't be doing this because if you have necrotic bowel, uh, doing this procedure might actually contribute to perforation of this necrotic bowel. Right. Once you've inserted this rigid sigmoidoscope, you take out the stroker, the tip, right? So then you have an opening. There's a little glass cap that you put on there so that you can then insufflate air to open up the lumen of the um, rectum and sigmoid. And then you can actually try and guide the instrument through the narrowing. And you can then through this, you can then open the back glass and try and insert a rubber tube uh, like a thick Foley catheter. Uh, surgeons have used argyle catheters, which we normally put into the chest as chest drains to uh, drain this as well. And that tube can be left in for 48 hours. Right? However, this is not the definitive management. We still have to proceed to laparotomy and we have to resect that uh, redundant sigmoid. Right? If you fail to do that, the patient, you send the patient home, they're going to come back uh, with the same condition in a few months or years. And the second time they come back, they may not be so lucky. They may now present uh, with necrotic bowel and they can actually die from this condition. We've seen young patients who present late actually dying from this condition. Okay, any questions, please put up your hands. Okay, this is just uh, another schematic showing you the sigmoid volvulus. And uh, this is an endoscopic picture taken with a flexible endoscope. Right, and this shows the twist. Right? This is where the bird beak appearance appears, right? if you were to instill um, contrast. And this is the point, if you're using a rigid sigmoidoscope, you can also use a flexible colonoscope uh, or sigmoidoscope to gently try and insert through this twist here. And you may possibly be able to deflate this massively dilated uh, colon here, right? and thereby um, reduce the risk of ischemia and 
perforation and thereby optimize the patient, gives you some time to optimize the patient before having to take them to theater. Okay, is that clearly understood? Uh, the either rigid or flexible sigmoidoscopy is merely a temporizing manager, a management option. The patient requires definitive surgery and that definitive surgery is the resection of a redundant sigmoid colon. Good. All right, so just to outline what we spoke about, surgical management, um, if there is evidence of perforation, the patient will be peritonitic. Ischemia, the patient may be peritonitic as well as having uh, features of metabolic acidosis on blood gas. Um, if you try to decompress using a flatus tube and a rigid sigmoidoscope or flexible sigmoidoscope and it fails, and if the patient has repeated volvulus, uh, you may want to uh, proceed to surgical management to prevent it from recurring. The surgical options, um, I'd like someone to explain to me, one person to just explain to me what the first one is and what the second one is. So it's sigmoid colectomy and primary anastomosis and what is a Hartman's procedure. Uh, who can we ask? Sidelile and Kize. Sidelile, are you with us? Yes, Dr. Mendes. Hi, Sidelile. So choose one of these two, and can you tell me what it actually means? Uh, uh, take the sigmoid colectomy. Yep. Uh, it's because it's uh, removing the an, an area of the left side of the of the bowel, especially yeah. the sigmoid colon. Mm -hmm. And what does yeah, primary anastomosis mean? Mm. You're connecting the other two ends of the... Correct. Right. So you've got a segment of bowel, which was abnormal. You've taken out that segment. You're left with two ends, a proximal end and a distal end. And you're going to reattach those and suture them together. Right. So that's what a primary anastomosis is. Now, that can only be done if uh, the bowel quality is good. Right. The blood supply is good. There's no contamination. Right. But... The safest option is a Hartman's procedure. We're gonna, thanks to Delilah, we're gonna ask someone else to explain what a Hartman's procedure is. Sinetembe um, Sibia. Sinetembe, are you with us? Hi, doctor, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, I think a Hartman's procedure is when they resect the, the ischemic part of the bowel, but then they don't join the two ends. They create right. a colostomy, they give the patient a colostomy bag. Yes, correct. Right, so they bring out an end colostomy and the distal stump. Remember, we said if you cut out a segment, you're going to have a proximal end and a distal end. So the proximal end, you bring it out on the skin as a uh, colostomy and the distal end is sutured closed, right? And later on, you can come back and reconnect those two pieces once the patient is recovered and they're doing a lot better, maybe uh, three months after all of this, you can bring the patient back for closure of Hartman's or reversal of Hartman's procedure. Okay, is that clearly understood? Any questions, please put up your hands. Everyone is uh, very silent. Uh, I hope you're understanding everything. Right, there's no questions. Okay, then this is just a picture of a operative, uh, intraoperative picture, right? A huge dilated loop of sigmoid. It's been untwisted. You can see it looks quite red and inflamed, but I think it is potentially viable. But you can see once again why it looks like a coffee bean. Okay, now moving on to CA colon. Um, you have a growth, neoplasm, tumor, whatever you prefer to call it, that can develop in any part of the colon, right? And there are slight differences 
um, in the symptomatology and the presentation if the patient presents um, who, very, who presents with a right-sided tumor as opposed to a left-sided tumor. Can anyone uh, tell me what they think the two differences are between right and left colon and why uh, this might happen? Loeen Thiessen. Hello, hi. Hello, yeah, can you hear you? Um, I'm thinking more of the bleeding. Mm -hmm. So if it's left-sided, it's more closer to the anus. So will the blood be more like sort of occult bleeding? Um, like Frank, not like Frank, but sort of the blood on the left-hand side would be more brighter or redder as compared to the right because no. it would take a longer time no really no no okay no <laughs> i'm not sure so what is the difference between the right and left colon you can actually maybe see it on this picture here on the this is the right colon here and this is the left colon can you tell me what the differences are okay I, the right yeah the right side is more uh, dilated because there's the cecum. It's a bigger, yeah. So even if there's no it's obstruction, bigger. right? Obviously, if there's obstruction, then it's going to get dilated. Even in the absence of obstruction, the cecum and the ascending colon is a larger diameter than the left side of the colon. So mm -hmm. what, what can you infer from that? There's two presentations for CA colon. One is bleeding and one is obstruction. So which one is more likely to bleed? Which one is more likely to obstruct? Would, Between right and left. Would the right be more likely to bleed? Correct. Right. Because of the large diameter, it's less likely to obstruct. And also remember that the contents on the left side of the cecum, of the, uh, the, sorry, on the right side of the bowel, are more like small bowel contents. Remember that there's the terminal ileum emptying into the cecum. So the feces in the right side of the colon are very liquid. So it's less likely to obstruct for two reasons. One, liquid feces, and two, the diameter. Right? So these typically present with bleeding. The problem is that the blood may not be obvious. Right? You, the patient may not notice the blood in the stool right? uh, because it it, you, 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 in that respect, you are correct. The blood has to travel all the way through the colon, and by the time it reaches the anal canal, it's not actually visible, right? So what we do have to do is this test for occult blood. Right? There are special tests that can be done on stool. You send the stool sample to the laboratory and ask them to assess for fecal occult blood, right? And if there is blood, then we would need to screen the patient further by what would you do, Loin? If you picked up fecal um, occult blood and you suspected a right-sided malignancy, how would you uh, search for it? Could do a colonoscopy. Correct, right? You're going to give the patient bowel prep and then you're going to put a flexible colonoscope through the anus, try and thread it through all the way uh, to the cecum. And if you can't get through because of an obstruction, then you will hopefully see it and biopsy it, and then you could get a histological diagnosis of malignancy, and thereafter you can treat the patient appropriately. Right, now, um, so the right side presents with bleeding, the left side presents with? Obstruction. Obstruction, correct. Like obstruction. Right. So because of the narrow uh, lumen and the more solid stool, left-sided malignancies typically present with obstruction. They can also bleed. It's not to say that they don't bleed, but they're more likely to present with obstruction. And what um, one of the things that we need to look at, if you have a patient that presents to you in the outpatients department, uh, family medicine, with a problem of anemia, right? This is one of the things that you need to think of, GIT, blood loss, right? So can someone else tell me uh, what other source of GIT blood loss you need to look for? Thank you, Louis. Someone, uh, anyone want to volunteer? Pumzila Shabangu. Pumzila, are you with us? Mm. 
Okay, so the question was um, a patient presents with anemia, right? Yes. Um, obviously, in a female patient, you're going to think a uh, female patient in the childbearing age, you're going to consider just um, uh, menorrhagia, right? Heavy periods, mm. very common cause of anemia. But let's say it's a male patient, they're in their 60s, right? They're otherwise uh, generally well. Um, so obviously, colon CA is one of the sites of uh, GIT blood loss. So you're going to get fecal occult blood like we spoke about just now. As Loween said, we might proceed to a colonoscopy. So where else may you get blood loss from the GIT and how are you going to diagnose that? Uh, I'm not from the GIT. GIT. I'm not no. sure. Come see there. Don't say that. Think about it. Where else in the GIT does it bleed? Okay, let's keep. Uh, maybe they could be vomiting the blood. Yes. So where would that be coming from? Where would so the, the most likely cause would maybe be the, the upper GI. Yes. So an upper GI. So the two common sources of GI bleeding is upper and lower GI. Yeah. Right. So the upper GI T. How would you make this diagnosis? What What are your possibilities? What lesions in the upper GI T? 60 year old man. So um, the patient could be have, having uh, like a peptic ulcer disease. Yes, peptic ulcers, right? Maybe he takes a lot of aspirin or uh, yeah. ibuprofen because he's got backache or joint pain, right? So it could be a benign cause, peptic ulcer disease. Very good. Anything else? Opposite of benign? So it could be like uh, things in terms of malignancies, yes. like esophageal CA. Yes, it could be esophageal CA. Those typically don't present with anemia, um, but a gastric CA would, right? Because oh. they typically they bleed. They may cause hematemesis or they may cause bleeding, um, trickling of blood, which is then um, carried through the small bowel and all the way to the rectum and they may present with Molina stool. Right? So you may not always have, um, you may not always have fresh vomiting of blood, but you may, the patient may present with Molina stool. And then Molina stool is the blood that is altered. Basically, does any, can anyone tell me what Molina stool actually is? It's this dark purple blackish color that you pick up if you do a PR examination, you actually see this on your glove, right? Can anyone tell me, Pumzila, do you know what? how Molina stool actually comes about. I've actually given you a clue. It comes from the upper GIT. It goes all the way through the uh, duodenum small bowel. Okay, let's give Pumzila a break. Anyone else? Zara Tumal. Um. Yes, because uh, it's, I think because it's from the upper GI, then the blood, I'm guessing it um, hemolyzes, which is why then it, you're getting darks, you're getting blood together with a mixture of stool. So you're getting darker stools. Yeah, so it's not, yeah, we're not quite hemolyzing. Um, hemolysis refers to a process of a breakdown of blood cells inside the blood stream in the blood vessels. Right, so this is, uh, it's actually digestion, partial digestion of the blood cells. Right, so remember you've got digestive organ, um, sorry, digestive enzymes in the GIT, and these are going to mix with the blood and actually start partially digesting them. So that's why you get this partial, this purple, dark purple, black color. Okay, and that's what explains uh, Melina stool, right? So this is Got nothing to do with uh, left colonic or right colonic tumors. It's just a little bit of a discussion around GIT bleeding. Okay, good. Thank you, Zara. Okay, so we've got left colon tumor, right colon tumor. Now we're going to go through a clinical presentation. Case history, you can see the patient has a grossly distended abdomen, 
62 year old hypertensive male patient, no previous surgery, right? This is important. And then you can see there's no surgical scar. Uh, we can't really see the inguinal area, but one would have to carefully examine that because even in a 62 year old patient, uh, adhesive bowel obstruction would still more likely be the commonest cause. The patient did complain of a change in bowel habits. There was obstipation for two days and there was intermittent PR bleeding. Right, the clinical examination, uh, he has a distended abdomen as seen in the photograph. It was tympanic, however, it was not peritonitic. Hernial orifices were examined and noted to be patent. And on PR, there was no masses palpable. Right, this is the x-ray of the same patient. And you can see a grossly distended cecum, uh, 10 centimeters, right? 10 centimeters across, that's um, grossly abnormal, more than five centimeters is abnormal. So this is almost double, right? And um, the danger is that the obstruction, which is likely on this side, the radiologist pointed out that there was an abnormality on the left side. The obstruction is, you can see dilated transverse colon here, right? Going all the way, all of that is causing back pressure on the cecum and because the cecum is already the widest part of the colon, uh, according to Laplace's law, uh, which is one of those laws from your high school physics, um, the cecum is at risk of perforation. Right? So you can actually have a tumor on the left side and you can have a perforation of the cecum on the right. Okay, so perforation would obviously uh, be a major problem because there would be overt peritonitis patient would deteriorate rapidly. So the idea is to diagnose this quickly and um, treat it accordingly. Investigations that were done, routine bloods were normal. Arterial blood gas showed some evidence of metabolic alkalosis, not acidosis, right? So there are no obvious features of uh, bowel necrosis. So we still have some time. X-rays show grossly dilated large bowel with multiple air fluid levels, okay? Now, the management of the colonic tumors. All right, let's ask someone. We have given you a clue that this depends on whether it's obstructing, perforated, or penetrating, right? Penetrating means it penetrates into the retroperitoneum and it may thereby become immobile and irresectable. Njabulo um, Nene. Shabula, are you with us? No, Jabula. Let's choose someone else. Sipelele mm, Zondi. Sipilele, yes? Uh, uh, Doctor Nairo, I'm not sure, but if there's obstruction, I think we would want to relieve the obstruction. So if the tumor can be excised, like if we can, if there are clearly defined margins, maybe we could try to resect the tumor. Yes. So uh, if it's obstructing, you want to try and remove it, right? But what if you, what if you cannot remove it or what if the Patient is not fit for surgery. Do you have know of any other options? The compression. Sorry? The compression. Decompression, how? Huh? Maybe by uh, putting the, the, the scope, maybe. So, okay, you're on to something there. Um, a colonoscopy may be able to help, but there's something specific that we do with the colonoscopy. Right? Remember that the uh, proximal colon is full of heavily laden with stool and uh, liquid, right? There may be some air there, but it may not, may not be possible to decompress it um, using the colonoscope. The colonoscopic channel is very narrow it's only about three millimeters. So three millimeters is not gonna be good enough to suck out all these vast amounts of stool, right? The stool is just gonna block the scope. But there is something else that you can do with the scope. Can you 
maybe think along those lines. If there's any volunteers, please put up your hands. So we, Sipilele is onto something. He says he's going to use a colonoscope, but there's something further that we need than just the colonoscope. Like, can maybe can other option maybe like uh, chemotherapy, also surgical option, Hartman procedure. So uh, yes. Chemotherapy, would, I would consider that where the tumor is penetrating and irresectable, right? But in the acute phase, we've got an obstructing lesion, we've got a perforation, right? We need to do something about this. We can't use chemotherapy or chemo radiation for this because the patient is acutely ill. Usually, chemo radiation bookings are in three weeks' time, next month, right? We need to do something now for this patient. So you're along the right lines, colonoscopy and something, okay? We don't know what that something is. Maybe someone else can volunteer. What about perforation? If there's a perforation, what do you need to do, Sipilele? Perforation? Yeah. So maybe put a patch. Sorry? Uh, yeah, I think maybe you put a patch. So you need to tell me that you want to do a laparotomy, yeah. right? Yeah. You're not going to just patch things. You need to get in there first. So follow a logical sequence. This patient will require an emergency laparotomy, right? And we then need to assess intraoperatively what we can do, whether we can resect the tumor, whether we can possibly do a Hartman's procedure like we spoke about just now, right? Um, or it may even be possible to do a primary resection, I mean, a resection and a primary anastomosis, right? Anyone want to volunteer any other options? Thanks, Sipalele. Caitlin Theophilus. Um, no, I'm not sure, Doc. Okay. Guys, um, I did put all these uh, slides up and I did give you all reading material. Did you all get access to this? Sunira has a hand up. Sunira? Um, I read that, is it endoscopic dilatation and stenting? Yes, correct. That's it, good, right. Anything... Um, further on perforation and penetrating? So I think that if it's penetrating, uh, you would need to uh, do a, a colectomy. Maybe the patient would need palliative care, so. Okay, so sure. if, it's, if it's irresectable, right? Uh, that suggests that you cannot do a colectomy. You can't remove the tumor because it's maybe okay. penetrating around uh, the common iliac vessels. Right, and if you go digging about there, the patient will start bleeding and then you can actually cause the patient to bleed to death. Um, or okay. maybe it's penetrating into the kidney and you can't just whip out the kidney, okay? Yes. So um, what are your options? You've got a, let's say a patient who's got an obstructing lesion. Uh, there's an obstruction in the colon, but you do the laparotomy, you, you, you maybe you don't have the facilities, right? This is colonoscopy and stenting, it's not easily available. We only really have it at places like uh, Albert Latuli, right? The rest of the hospitals don't have it. So we would probably um, be forced to do a laparotomy, right? So what are your options at laparotomy? You've got this obstruction, you can't resect the tumor. What, what um... could you possibly do? I'm not sure. Okay, anyone else? Any volunteers? Let's ask one last person. Kwanele Zibani. Kwanele, are you there?
con L. No con L. No cuando Zulu. Wanda? I don't know. Uh, unfortunately, I'm also not sure. Okay. Uh, guys, uh, did you all get the reading material I uh, uploaded for you guys to Moodle? No, Wanda? Did you all see the stuff that I uploaded to Moodle? There was uh, basically this entire presentation was there. And I even uploaded a previous seminar that covered the whole topic of bowel obstruction. Um, we did, I did get uh, the seminar mm -hmm. and the seminar. Yeah. So did no one read it? Thanks, Nakwanda. So guys, uh, I would expect you all to actually read this in advance of the tutorial because it's going to make it easier for you to understand and hopefully you know, you're going to have questions that you will uh, get from actually reading. Right? The uh, answer here that I'm looking for is to do a colostomy. Right? If the patient is obstructing and you cannot remove it because it's irresectable, you can do a colostomy. Right? You can do a sigmoid colostomy. You can do a colostomy where you bring out the descending colon, where you bring out the transverse colon, or you can even do an ascending colostomy. Right? So that helps you to bypass the obstruction. So if there's an obstruction low down at the recto sigmoid junction, you can do a sigmoid colostomy where you uh, bring out the bowel to the skin and all that dilated bowel can now deflate through the colostomy and the colostomy can be uh, very beneficial to the patient because they can now get chemo radiation therapy while you try and shrink the tumor before you take them back. So even if the tumor was initially irresectable, right, you do a colostomy, you send them for chemo radiation, and then you bring them back for surgery, and hopefully you can offer them some kind of a curative uh, resection, despite the fact that the tumor was initially irresectable. I'll understand what I'm saying. Please put up your hand if you're unclear. Right, if there's a perforation, the patient will require an emergency laparotomy. Right, where you're going to wash out all the contamination. Uh, generally, it's not a good idea to try and repair, repair the perforation because um, it's usually very close to the malignancy or if the malignancy itself has perforated through the um, anterior wall of the colon, uh, that's not going to hold suture. It's just, it's just going to continue to leak. So you're either then going to try and do a resection at that time. If it is irresectable, you would then try and bring out a proximal colostomy. So let's say this entire area, uh, sorry, I'm pointing here. This entire area of the colon is obstructed and perforated, right? You can bring out a colostomy there or there, right? Or even way back here, right? And then you try and uh, temporize this and hopefully the patient will recover. You can then send them for chemo radiation and bring them back for definitive surgery later on. Okay, and if it's irresectable, the same thing, colostomy. So colostomy is your best option. Uh, the uh, GI unit in Albert Lutuli may have these facilities available where over a guide wire, you dilate the colonic stricture and you put a stent, right, similar to CA esophagus, right, which is done from the top. And this can uh, tide the patient over, right? And you can then send them for chemo radiation and consider definitive surgery subsequently. Okay, so we are coming to an end now. This is malignant bowel obstruction, the same patient. I had multiple air fluid levels in the colon. You can see these are large loops of bowel. They are haustra. In other areas, the haustra are lost. So this is um, large bowel obstruction with the step ladder occurring in the large bowel as opposed to the small bowel. You can see a few uh, patches or radiolucent areas of small bowel, 
centrally located, right? but the main issue here is malignant bowel obstruction, um, and that's why the patient had a massively distended abdomen. Uh, in Jabulo Nene, you had your hand, you got your hand up. In Jabulo? In Jabulo put his hand down. Okay. Okay, so malignant bowel obstruction, that was an just an ordinary erect abdominal x-ray. Contrast was then uh, put rectally. Remember, I spoke to you last week about the different type of x-rays, different types of contrast, water-soluble being gastrographin, non-water-soluble being barium. This is a barium enema. Uh, this is the rectum. And this is a proximal rectum. And what we're seeing here, does anyone know what we describe this as here? Zulake? I uh, think, Doctor, it's, it's called the apple core sign. Yes, excellent, right? It's an apple core. If you look at it, I'll, I'll show you now a picture of an apple that looks like the bottom of the apple. That's the top of the apple that's all been eaten. And this is the core, right? So this is an apple core here, right? I've tilted it to show you it lining up and then I've superimposed it. Can you see why it's called an apple core? Okay, very good, Zulake. Right, and this is the actual tumor visible on colonoscopy. You can see this middle section causes this narrowing, right? And that's what causes the apple core appearance on barium enema, right? So this was all the same patient, that same 62 year old patient that we spoke about just now. And this is this resection specimen, right? This is a piece of colon that has been taken out. It has been opened and you can actually see this narrowing of the malignancy. It's even penetrating beyond the wall, right? There's a staging called Duke's staging, right? Which is the old staging method for colon cancer where it's gone beyond the wall. Okay, and that is a classic example of malignant obstruction. All right, so we're coming to an end now. Uh, in summary, most importantly, paralytic ileus is not a cause of mechanical bowel obstruction. However, it is the commonest presentation of abdominal pain, abdominal distension with peritonitis. Okay, so please don't confuse that with mechanical bowel obstruction, right, and treat it appropriately. Commonest cause of paralytic ileus in our setting is acute perforated appendicitis. Now, what the real common cause of mechanical bowel obstruction is adhesive bowel obstruction, that of small bowel. Then we can get obstructed hernias, inguinal and incisional. We spoke about worm bolus obstruction and volvulus. Right? We spoke about intersusception. Right? Then we spoke about large bowel obstruction, including malignancy, which we've just gone through, and volvulus, which commonly affects the sigmoid, but may also affect the cecum. Okay, that brings us to the end of this lecture. Uh, we've still got a few minutes. If there are any questions, any questions, anyone? Please put up your hand or unmute your mic. Someone was supposed to remind me about Ogilvy syndrome, right? Ogilvy syndrome is, um, pseudo-obstruction of the colon, right? It presents with uh, gross distension of the abdomen. Plain abdominal x-rays may show markedly dilated colon, uh, but there's actually no mechanical cause. So it's a pseudo-obstruction. It can occur in patients who are institutionalized, um, adults that have Down syndrome. Um, they frequently present with um, with Ogilvy syndrome, which is a pseudo obstruction. It's very important to treat this conservatively. Try using fleet enemas, bowel prep. Uh, there's even a neostigmine, which is an anesthetic drug, uh, which can be used to assist in patients with Ogilvy pseudo obstruction. But please, by all means, do not take this patient for a laparotomy because it will be a total disaster and there is nothing that can be surgically done for these patients. Right, remember Ogilvy syndrome, it's a bit of a trap. Um, those patients have pseudo-obstruction of the colon. 
Okay, no one's put up their hand. If there are no questions, we are going to stop at this point. Um, I will um, uh, end the meeting and you will get a questionnaire, a Survey Monkey questionnaire. Uh, please, can you complete the questionnaire? Uh, thank you very much to everyone. Uh, next week.